Well, today is Tuesday and J July the 18th. The rookies report on Wednesday. Training camp is finally upon us. I know I'm excited, TJ. I know you're excited. Fans are excited. A lot of that excitement stems from the you know the way that the Lions ended last season. Uh, also, what they did in free agency, the draft. There's just so much to be excited about, and the prospects of just you know being a team that's favored to win the division. They haven't won the division since it was labeled the North. Uh, they haven't won. They've won one playoff game since 1957. So the excitement is palpable. There's a long way to go before we get to, you know, even the first preseason game, but just to have the lions in camp, knowing that football season is here is exciting. How would you handle the leaving the family and going to training camp? Well, I, I know it's somewhat disappointing at times to be leaving the family, leaving the kids, but there's also this excitement of, Hey, Football season starting. Yeah, and if some when you step foot in the building again, and I know, look, these guys were just here a month ago for OTAs, right? It's not like they've been gone for that long. Right. Um, but this is when it becomes real, you know. Like this is this week for me as a player was always uh, bittersweet. It was disappointing because like the summer's over, right? You're not going to be able to go. Uh, vac vacations yeah. are done. Last like, time you're, you're going to feel good. Yeah, your boat days are done. You're like drinking days are done. Like you're going into the dungeon, right? For the next uh, probably four or five months um but with that being said it also it has this appeal to it like almost like that first day of school right where you're excited and you're going in and you're seeing your buddies again and uh you're just getting ready to you know align for one common goal i mean the, yeah. the, the excitement that always surrounds training camp is is for a player uh it's great uh because there's 32 teams there's 32 coaches that are going to sit in the meeting tomorrow and talk about Super Bowl aspirations. And we know there's probably, you know, maybe six, seven teams that legitimately have, legit have a shot. shot. There's yeah. probably five or six that have absolutely no shot. And everybody else, you don't know, man. Somebody could make a make a uh make a run and be a surprise team. So uh it's always it's always great this time being a being a player, getting back into the building and really just uh OTAs are done, right? The fake football's done, right? The helmet and the and the walkthroughs and the jog through, like those are done. Like you're working now to play games. I mean, you only got, what is it? Three weeks before they actually face another team in a yeah. preseason game. Uh, it's coming, it's going to come up pretty quick. So uh, bittersweet was the best way I could describe it. It's tough leaving the family. Uh, it's tough, you know, giving up your, your summer vacation, so to say, but uh, it's always exciting getting ready to start that new chapter. Do you remember rookie training camp? Uh, and ours was, we used to leave. And we weren't at our normal, you know, facility in Ashburn, Virginia for the Redskins. We went up to Frostburg, Maryland, which I was very grateful for because the weather was much like it is here in Michigan. You know, you could have some hot days, but for the most part, it cools off at night. It was cooler during the day. Uh, but I remember pulling in and excited because it was you have different landmarks along the way. Right. You've got, you know, uh, the combine, you have the draft and, you know, when you're drafted, you feel like, okay, this dream could become a reality, but it's never really until you show up to training camp, you put the pads on, you're like, hey, I'm I'm actually playing against NFL opponents. I'm yeah. in an NFL training camp. And there's a, a lot of nervousness to it because you want to live up to the goals and aspirations that you had for yourself, um, other people around you, your college football coaches, your high school coach. Like there's a lot that you want to live up to. And I just remember – going into that first camp that excitement the nervousness it was a it was a one time feeling you're always a little bit nervous about going into training camp because life changes and but your perspective changes as you get you know year 2 year 3 year 4 in the NFL but that 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 unique feeling i had as a rookie it only happened once as well as the dues you had to pay as a rookie yeah and i i think that's because uh for a few months there in the summer as a rookie, you're kind of still on cloud nine, right? Yeah. You're, you're coming out of the draft. Uh, you know, obviously a, a life changing event. You're going in the NFL. It's like, it, you. I don't want to say starstruck, but you know what I mean? You're living on a different planet where it's like, Oh my God, like this is real. Right. Yeah. Um, once you hit training camp though, it's it, the switch was so fast for me. I remember being a rookie where the summer, the OTAs, the, the mini camps, everything you're doing in May and June, 
was more of a teaching period, right? If you made a mistake, it wasn't the end of the world, right? It was, hey, let's fix this. I know you're a rookie, right? Let's get this going. When you hit training camp, it's like if you make a mistake, hey, next guy in, let's go. We don't have time, man. Like the learning period is over. That was what the last couple months before we're gearing up for, you know, real regular season football for real flying bullets. And that for me was – uh, a bit of a different stressor because it's like the urgency picks up a little bit, right? You got pads on. We know for offense and defensive linemen, it ain't real football until you're wearing pads, right? <laughs> Everybody else, if they're in helmets and shells, yeah. they can jog through. They're not getting contacted. Once you put the pads on for O-line, D-line, it's like, oh, this is a different game. Like, yeah. this is a different beast. And I just remember how fast uh, training camp was as far as just the play-to-play, drill-to-drill, uh, j- the urgency, right, the energy, Everything around it was like, damn, like I got to take it up another level. I'm yeah. off that cloud nine uh, period where, yeah, I'm the rookie. I was just drafted. Everybody was shaking my hand. You, now you got to go out there and perform. You got to do it every single play. One you got to do it every pro, single day. One on one run. And, and we know, I mean, John, I was part of the old school uh, CBA where my first couple of years, we still had the two a days. Oh, yeah. We didn't have all these breaks. We didn't have a limit on how many days you could be in pads before you had to have an off day, it, how you, a certain time period. You're only on, allowed on the field for, you know, two and a half hours a day, whatever it is. Uh, we didn't have that, John. And I know you didn't have that no, either. And weighing, that was different being a rookie. in and out before and after practice. Oh I mean, that was a team rule. If you didn't weigh out after the morning practice, it was a fine yeah. because if you lost as, as big guys, if we lost 15 pounds, 15 Easy. pounds, you had to put on at least half of it, which was all obviously water weight before they would allow you back on the field for the second practice. Yeah, and being a rookie, you know, the first practice, a lot of those days, you know, our our veteran guys, you know, Chad Clifton, who was a 10-year vet at left tackle, he wasn't doing two-a-days, right? Yeah. So I'm taking all the reps at left tackle, and then I'm coming back in the afternoon doing it again, and it was like, holy, like, this is a different beast, man. You really – players now don't have to go through that. Uh, it's still intense, don't get me oh, wrong. Yeah, but you just know a different I mean? intensity. Like, it's a different intensity, and – I think the one thing that these rookies are going to learn um, is that it's even faster than what it was when they got acclimated back in OTAs, right? Everybody hears about the speed of the game. Oh, everybody's faster. Everybody's strong. Everybody's, everything happens a little quicker. It's going to go up even another level once these bullets start flying live, uh, probably when they put pads on sometime next week. And one of the advantages of having – we talk about the the grind of the two-a-days and, you know, and we – we talk about how tough it was, and and you know we like to say that we were tougher than today's player. But here's the advantage that we had at that time: is if I had a bad practice in the morning, or even if I had just one or two bad reps, I knew in the back of my mind I had the opportunity to put something else on film later in the day. If that happens now, now you've got to wait at least a day, and maybe even till the next afternoon or two days away before you guys go full pads again. And show your coaches that you can make that adjustment. You can make that block. You can make, you know, you can you can make up for your mistake. And and I think that's one of the disadvantages that, especially the young players, you know, veteran players, you know, hey, they make a mistake. Yeah, they'll talk through it with the coach, but there's not as much pressure as a young player. Right. You want every opportunity you possibly can. Um, that kind of leads me into our next topic, and that is position battles going into training camp and. You could talk about position battles. You could talk about individual battles, guys coming back from injuries. When you look at this roster and you look at, you know, some of the different situations that have come up, whether it's through adding a player in the draft, through adding players through free agency, or guys just, hey, maybe they didn't add a whole lot at that position, but they're expected to get better. What are you looking at when you see the roster? Gosh, I think the first thing, I mean – you can call it biased. I'm looking at that right guard spot. You know what I mean? I, a guy like Hal Vitae that missed all of last season, had that injury that uh, forced him to be on IR. Didn't even know if he was going to be able to come back and play this year. Sounds like he's in good shape. Sounds like he's back to kind of that form that he was in in, in 2021 when he played pretty damn good. Yeah. Uh, they brought in Graham Glasgow, a guy that with a lot of experience, uh, was here for a while, center guard, uh, went to Denver on a pretty big contract, started guard out there for them. Uh, I think that's going to be the first battle that I'm going to look at because when you talk about strengths of this team, everybody seems to mention the offensive line. I think it's a unanimous uh, pick that if you ask what the strength of this team is, a lot of people are going to say it's their offensive line. They're damn good. Uh, but there's still a question mark there at right guard, right? We we know that 
Vitae, like I said, played pretty well in that 2021 season. Uh, what's he going to look like coming back off of this injury when it's the first time he's going to play real football again in in, in a year, right? I mm-hmm. think last year training camp is when he ended up going out. And a guy like Graham Glasgow, what is he going to bring to this team? Can he provide uh, competition at that right guard level to maybe step in there and be the guy? Or is he going to be the guy that we saw with Evan Brown last year? That's going to be kind of that six-man interior guy, can play both guard spots, can play center spot. We know Frank has been battling – you know, toe and foot injuries for the last couple of years. If something happens to him, I think they feel comfortable having Graham there uh, as an insurance policy. But that's going to be the first position that I'm excited to see once the pads come on is uh, who's going to stick out. And it's it's not going to take a day or two. It's probably going to take two or three weeks. But who starts to separate themselves at that right guard spot that can fill in uh, what are pretty big shoes on that offensive line? They have high expectations for themselves. Uh a lot of com- competitive uh, athletes on that line. Who's going to be the guy at right guard that sticks out? That's going to that's going to earn that spot. Yeah, another one staying with the offense uh, is that running back position. Now we know, obviously, David Montgomery, Jameer Gibbs, they're going to get the bulk of the carries. I think Craig Reynolds is probably going into camp as as RB three, but a guy that I'm really interested to see if he can work his way up the depth chart and possibly earn a position on this team is the undrafted rookie out of Minnesota, Mo Ibrahim. Uh, very productive when healthy at Minnesota. And I know he had, I think it was an Achilles. He, he's, he's been banged up a little bit. He's a physical style back, a little bowling ball, and has led the Big Ten, was all Big Ten as a running back. And if he can prove that he can stay healthy and, you know, if they use him in limited situations, he could be, you know, he could fill some of the production gap left by Jamal Williams down on the goal line, short yardage. I know that David Montgomery is probably going to be the guy that's called upon for some of that, but I'm really curious to see if he can work his way up the depth chart and take a little bit of the load off of Gibbs and Montgomery uh, and be a, a weapon that's utilized. You know, maybe it's, you know, maybe he doesn't see much time until you know, week six or seven, but eventually if, if the coaches can, you know, gain some confidence in him, the trainers and and the staff and the front office can gain some confidence say, yeah, this guy can stay healthy. I think he could be a a sneaky, good asset for the lions. Yeah, I agree with you. I think uh, tight end spot, um, you know, man, they might just get it done by committee at that point. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised uh, week one, if, if Laporta comes out as the number one guy, but uh, we know they like rotating those guys through. You're going to see, um, you know, you're going to see Brock Wright again in there in some certain packages. You're going to see another six offensive linemen in there in certain packages yep. at the tight end spot. Uh, you're going to see probably a rotation of guys in there. The other thing, uh, offense, just to kind of round out the offense, is who's going to who's going to be the number two guy to start the season out at receiver, right? We obviously know we have Amon Ross St. Brown, but Jameson's gonna, not going to be there for six weeks, right? You're looking at Marvin Jones, Josh Reynolds, Khalif Raymond, maybe Tom Kennedy, maybe one of these young guys, right? We know they drafted Antoine Green and uh, undrafted guy Dylan Drummond actually sounded like he had a really good OTAs. But that's that that seems to me maybe an underrated, um, you know, maybe a concern, maybe heading into training oh. camp is who that number two receiver is. You look at – and even Marvin Jones last year when he was in Jacksonville caught, you know, 46 passes, 500 yards, three touchdowns, pretty much – uh, exact numbers as Josh Reynolds, right? Josh Reynolds had 38 catches, around 500 yards, and three touchdowns. Uh, is that really what you're the production that you need from a number two spot? It's probably a little bit low. Um, so that's going to be something that I want to see as training camp develops the first couple weeks is who's going to be that number two guy, right? DJ Chark isn't there anymore. They don't really have that uh, burner type without Jamison Williams that we saw with DJ Chark last year that could take the top off of a defense. Is one of these number two guys going to step up and and show that they can fill that role and fill a, a void that is probably going to need a lot of targets this year when you start thinking Amon Ra is going to get double teamed a lot, right? If Sam Laporta can come out and show he's a threat, he's going to get double teamed a lot. That number two spot is going to be very vital to what this offense is able to do. Yeah, and I think it's going it, to some of it's going to come down to how do they utilize Jameer Gibbs? We know he's he at Alabama, uh, he's lined up at the slot. He can be used as a receiver. Not exclusively, but he's a guy that that you know they can use to help fill that void um, that J Mo is going to leave for the first six games, and I really think it's going to have to be Josh Reynolds. 
I think that familiarity, when we've heard about this for a couple of years since he, he signed in Detroit, that, that Jared Goff has with him uh, from their time out in L.A., I think we'll probably see that pay off. And, um, you know, it's interesting you mentioned the tight end position because I do think Sam Laporta is probably going to be the guy that starts at tight end. But it'll be interesting because there's – there's always a learning curve for every position and some take a little bit longer than others. And I think for tight end, it, it can take a little bit longer. And we see guys as they go through their career, you know, in year two, they're better than year one, year three, and you expect that progression. But for the tight end position, when you've got to do so many different things, obviously he's going to have to be a pass catcher. He's going to have to be a part of that, uh, you know, that threat. But he's also going to have to be a guy that understands where he's got to be, where his body's got to be, his pad level. And coming into the NFL as a run blocker, it's not an easy thing to do. You and I both did it, and we were trained yeah. in that task. And, yes, yeah, tight ends are as well. But I think that'll be interesting to see from him how he uses leverage, how he uses his footwork, hat and hands, all of those different things. Um, you know, what type of run blocker is he going to be as a rookie? Yeah, and I think we have to maybe – limit the expectations a little bit right i was actually i think it was last week i was bored i was looking at some stats uh, of some other tight ends when they first came to the league mm -hmm. like travis kelsey i think his first year him and george kittle and i'm just you know from what i remember i don't know the exact stats but their rookie years were you know 30 some catches you know 500 yards 34 touchdowns i mean nothing super yeah. impressive right that we see obviously what kind of players that those guys are now um, but like you said, I think tight end is a tough transition. You're going against a lot better athletes. You're going to be asked to block one-on-one, -on -one, especially in this offense. You have to run block. It's it's a requirement. Uh, if you're going to play uh, for Ben Johnson and for Dan Campbell at that position, you have to be able to block. And also, uh, this is a team that likes to utilize these tight ends in the passing game. I would just say, I for anybody that thinks Sam Laporte is going to come out and light the NFL on fire. Now, look, I hope he does. It would be great if he does, but the expectation should be a little bit tempered as far as the, what he's going to provide in the passing game uh, to maybe at least start off the season, first half of the season, uh, because it's, it's very rare that tight ends come into the league year one and just put up, uh, you know, what we're seeing lately, a thousand yards, you know, 12 yeah. touchdowns, whatever it is. Um, so we're going to have to make sure that uh, we're a little bit careful with what we expect out of Sam Laporta this year. Um, the other uh, switching over to the defensive side of things, I'm interested to see the progression of Aiden Hutchinson. I, I don't think there's any terms of or there's no position battle there, but I'm curious as to what they're going to do opposite him uh, at the other edge position. It, you know, what does James Houston do in year two? We know that at the end of the year last year, he you know he was shot out of a gun and just had a great rookie season, even though it was only what eight nine games. Yeah. Um, Romeo Aquara being fully healthy, having a full healthy offseason to train and get back. Charles Harris healthy again, restructured his deal to try and, uh, you know, make it a little bit more enticing to, to, to keep a roster spot. How do they manage that other that other edge position? And then you throw a guy like Josh Pascal in there. And I know Josh can be used uh, pretty much across the defensive front, but, you know, as, as it's labeled, he is an edge guy. So how do they operate things opposite Aiden Hutchin? I think it's going to be really interesting because Romeo, correct me if I'm wrong, but he's entering the last year of that three-year deal that he signed and then immediately got hurt. Yeah, uh, We kept thinking he was going to come back and be a, a, you know, a force last year. Eventually did get back on the field, but not as quickly as I think everybody had hoped or wanted him to. And, and him, you know, not that he was doing anything wrong, but that just took a longer time to heal. Yeah. Is it fully healed? Is he back to the guy that signed that that contract extension two and a half years ago? Yeah, if you talk about just overall competition on this team, I think the defensive line probably sticks out as being, uh, you know, number one. Yeah. And you mentioned Aiden Hutchinson. I really think if, look, you're looking at four starting spots on that defensive line, there's probably two that are etched in with you know permanent marker and that's going to be Aiden Hutchinson and I think that's going to be Lee McNeil I think he's a guy that they uh trust on the he's their best interior guy right mm -hmm. those two guys are going to be starters um barring anything unforeseen uh day one but that other defensive tackle spot too right I know Isaiah Bugs is a guy who played a lot for him last year uh, played in all 17 games 
Uh, John Kaminsky, you know, we all we all love the commish, man. He is just a blue collar, you know, tough. It can be used at any position. And we front. love him, right? He can play inside. He, he played a lot outside last year. But those other two spots, uh, you know, who's going to separate themselves to be able to earn that playing time? Uh, and what's going to be – you look at this defensive line, it's kind of weird. You say, man, they got a lot of dudes. They've got one dude that we think with Aiden Hutchinson. The rest are good players, but uh, the depth looks good, but you still need to be able to find guys that can go out there and be three-down players mm -hmm. and then have the guys behind them that when they come in, you know, five, six, seven plays into a series, uh, the teams just aren't changing their game plan because you've gotten significantly weaker uh, in those spots, right? And I think that they do have good competition there. Charles Harris, another guy uh, you mentioned coming back off an injury, obviously had the great 2021 season, played only six games last year, uh, missed a lot of time with injury. How hungry is he going to be to prove that he can still do it in the mm -hmm. NFL, right? How hungry is he going to be seeing a lot of these young players playing in the position that uh, he was the one dominating at just two years ago. Uh, the, the competition is going to be really good at that spot. I think you've got some young guys that can come in uh, and and hopefully provide a little bit more competition to some of these vets to say, you know what, I got to pick my shit up, man. This this young guy, he's on my ass, right? And that's going to make everybody better. But as long as you have a workhorse, like you mentioned, at Aiden Hutchinson, we expect to take another jump into year two. Uh, that should be pretty contagious to the rest of that group. Yeah, and Broderick Martin. You know, we heard everything about him. Didn't know anything about him until he was drafted. And then Brad Holmes, you know, traded up. He was drafted a day ahead of when he thought he was. Um, he was setting up for a party the next day. All of a sudden gets the phone call. He's drafted. How long does it take him to progress into being a player that they can count on? I think it's going to take some time. Uh, and just like we talked about on offense uh, with Hal Vitae, Levi owns Enrique. Uh, has been banged up, back injury. We keep hearing how, you know, hey, he's doing all the things that they expect him to do off the field in the training room, uh, but you can't make the club in the tub. And if he's not going to be able to stay healthy, that's a second-round pick that looks like, you know, in, in Brad Holmes' first draft, that that could be, you know, a wasted pick. Yeah. And I'm I'm hoping that he is able to stay healthy, and be a force. He can, when healthy, he's as quick of a defensive tackle as you're going to see. Yeah. But when I watched his time in Washington, it was, and this was my concern when they drafted him, it was kind of pick and choose when he decided to play hard. And when he turned it on, he was good. When he turned it off, he disappeared. Yeah. And you can go back uh, for all our listeners out there. We covered this, you know, probably, well, maybe a couple months ago when we talked about which players are going to have to come in and, kind of show that they're NFL players, yeah. right? Like you, you got a job on the line. Levi was one of those guys uh, that we discussed at length that could look heading into year three, man, like this is a prove it year, right? This is a year for guys where you can either show that you're going to be, you can add value to a team uh, or unfortunately for a lot of guys are going to show that maybe this is the, uh, maybe this is the end of the road. Now he hope, certainly hope none of these guys go through that. We hope yeah. everybody elevates their play, but we covered that at depth. The last position I just wanted to hit real quick was um, the linebacker spot, right? I think last year was – there were certainly games where that looked like a glaring weakness mm -hmm. uh, on this defense. Uh, the second half of the season um, was completely different. You know, you, you ended up getting a lot of – Alex Anzalone has been a guy that's taken a lot of slack. And I even say I've been hard on him at some at, at times too. Uh, you know, just looking at him saying, man, like just make the simple play, right? That's what you're there for. I thought he he had his best year last year. Started all 17 games, 130 tackles, a uh, handful of, uh, of them behind the line, uh, you know, threw in a, a couple sacks, I think. He was a guy that I think if you're looking at that linebacker position, they obviously just gave him – a pretty good deal, not you know super hefty, but right. enough they didn't break to the bank, but but he's enough be there enough that where he's going to be in and he's going to start right. They they trust him. He's a team captain. The guys in that locker room love him. Uh, he's the one guy that you look at and you could say, okay, he's probably his name's probably in there in in that sharpie, right? That coaches know they can trust him. He's going to be on the field. We obviously know that in today's NFL uh, defenses, a lot of it is nickel, a lot of it's dime. You're not playing the four three or the 5-2 like you used to. Maybe you will on first downs or certain situations in the game when, you know, the other team's going to run the ball. Now you're going to have your three guys on the field. But 
when you look at one other guy that's going to get a uh, majority of the playing time next to Alex Anzalone, look, I think this is a good problem to have. Derek Barnes is a guy who, uh, towards the end of last year, started to take that step that we needed to see, right? We've seen flashes uh, throughout the first couple years and then, you know, kind of fizzled out. Last year, we saw some good play from him. We obviously know Malcolm Rodriguez was kind of that uh, sweetheart last year. He was, a you know, a, a gem on hard knocks. And, yeah. you know, he was the guy, he was the good feel-good story that everybody liked watching. Had a pretty good rookie year, definitely some ups and downs, which is, expected especially out of a six-round pick right i think he exceeded expectations when when you talk about coming in last year and what he was able to provide but jack campbell's the big one right jack campbell what is he going to bring to this team whose spot is he going to take because look you don't waste a first round pick on a guy that you plan on playing on you know the punt team or kickoff right. return you just don't um so i would imagine that he's going to have probably the fast track to uh taking the majority of the snaps uh, next to Alex Anzalone, but he's still going to have to earn it. I don't think Malcolm Rodriguez is the type of guy that's going to back down uh, from competition and say, oh, just because they drafted a guy in the first round, you know, means I don't have a job anymore. I don't think that's going to happen. And this is the position that I think probably needs to take the biggest step uh, from what we saw production-wise last year. If this position group, the off-the-ball linebackers, can get after, uh, you know, opposing teams' quarterbacks with some of the pressure, some of the speed that they have, and look, if they can just – marginally improve in run defense uh that's going to be a huge step for that for this team going into the season yeah and i think defensively this is the year to make it or break it for uh, two guys that we talked about you mentioned Derek barnes if he doesn't continue to take that step forward uh, i could see the team moving on levi owns Enrique, if he can't prove to be healthy and contribute i could see the team moving on and those are two guys that brad holmes took in his first draft and uh, it's not a knock uh, you're not going to hit on every draft pick but those are just a couple of guys going into year three that you expect to be uh, mainstays, guys that you can count on yeah. in your defense. And it's not really even a knock, so to say, on the players itself. It's more of a, look, anytime you go through changes where maybe you had a guy last year that played a lot for you and, and played pretty well, and then this year you find out, oh, my goodness, they cut him, right? That's not necessarily a knock on the player as it is, uh, maybe just a positive aspect that the GM has brought in other players, a lot of good talent, right? And and sometimes you have to make those hard decisions. I remember going into last year, you know, a guy like remember twenty twenty one, they had a nickel corner, undrafted guy, AJ Parker, played a lot of defense uh, for what well, wasn't a great defense. Don't get me wrong, yeah. but he played a lot, you know, as a rookie. Then you go into year two, and everybody's talking about man, like this dude can take that next step. Fast forward in the training camp, he gets cut. And you're like, man, like nobody saw that coming. Well, that's that's not really a, a knock on what AJ Parker was. Maybe it was to the other guys, uh, just brought in a little bit higher level competition, yeah. right? You're always trying to improve your roster, uh, not only the top spots, but the bottom spots as well. And some of these guys that are floating around, you know, when you start talking about special teams, you start talking about roster spot, you know, 45 to the last one, 53 it's a very slight margin for a lot of these players. So I, 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 overall, I would, I didn't want to get into this today. I was a little disappointed when I heard the Deandre Hopkins news, because I'm like, man, like, yeah, don't, don't stop building this team. Right. Like yeah. don't stop building this team. But look, I, overall for the past couple months, as we head into training camp, I think I'm more excited now than I was, you know, even at the end of free agency, even at the end of the draft, like even at the beginning of OTAs, because you look at this roster top to bottom and you say, man, like they've got a chance, right? Mm -hmm. You can see where they're building. You can see the improvements uh, that have been made on paper, at least. Training camp is a great time uh, to be around for the fans to go down because now you get to see it on the field, right? We get to see all of these uh Get players that we're excited about and you hear about the speed and the athleticism and the playmaking ability looks great on paper now we get to go down to Allen park and actually watch it for ourselves and start to really get excited about what this team can do this year well as they continue to build as they continue to build towards the season uh we as tj mentioned we're going to be down at training camp uh, we're going to do some uh some episodes of uh, Necessary Eruptus from down there we're going to have some live shows i know tj is going to join us down there for a little bit as well so report day is tomorrow veterans in a few more days and we're off and running so we will be off and running here as we continue to take you through training camp uh right up to the regular season and through unnecessary roughness